Hey everybody, it's Corona Story Time. I'm Dave. I'm going to be reading from The Monk's Record Player by Robert Hudson. Back at the Hermitage that evening, Merton continued his deep dive. By the next day, he had absorbed all of the records, so that he was able to offer this assessment in his journal. Rich variety of things. I like best the middle, so far, protest songs, like Gates of Eden, which is full of a real prophetic ardor and irony, and power. But the newest Baroque obscenities, the dead voice, the noise of rock, the crowding in of new fashion, this is very intriguing, too. Intriguing is an extremely bad word. One does not get curious about Dylan. You are either all in or all out of it. I am in his new stuff. Four days later, in a short note to a magazine editor, Merton couldn't resist tossing in a Dylan non sequitur. I am with you, and I keep you in my prayers. Keep me in yours, too. As Bob Dylan says, everybody must get stoned. That same day, he jotted a gleeful note to Laughlin. Have some fine records of Dylan, and I'm working on an article on him for Jubilee. Exciting stuff. Very real, very good. New horizons in poetry opening up. Still expecting the book. The specific context for the phrase new horizons in poetry was the article Merton was currently writing about Scottish poet Edwin, Edwin Muir. In his book, The Estate of Poetry, Muir lamented the modern poet's lack of a wide audience. Poets, he felt, were writing almost exclusively for critics and other poets. Muir looked back fondly to the bygone days of traditional ballads when poetry was a shared property of a community of working people, when poems were sung as often as spoken. In his essay on Muir, Merton responded, Muir apparently had no inkling of the possibilities that have since surprised us. The influence of young Soviet poets reading their works in the parks, or the power exercised by an admittedly unruly poet, like Bob Dylan, making use of modern media. Dylan may certainly have more in common with mad comics than with Shakespeare, but he is nevertheless definitely conscious of a poetic vocation and has communicated an authentic fervor to an audience that is deeply involved. Merton himself was among the deeply involved, and throughout September he continued to absorb Dylan's music. At the end of the month, he wrote again to Laughlin. I've listened a bit to Bob Dylan's records. I think that rock and roll is rather essential to the poems. It is meant to bring out the shades of irony and all that. And his peculiar way of singing them, too, is part of it. Now that I am addicted, I think that just reading him on a printed page misses a lot of it, though it is good, too. In that last sentence, Merton is referring to the poetry printed on four of the five records in his possession. Poetry that was loose, iconoclastic, unafraid of being serious, surreal and nonsensical all at the same time. Dylan's poems demonstrated a deliberate technique and often contained sublimely striking lines and images. Just imagine how this line from the back cover of Bringing would have caught the attention of the contemplative monk. Experience teaches that silence terrifies people the most. But all this poetry got Merton thinking. What impact might his own poems have if set to music? He had even pondered that question in his Midsummer Diary. The authentic fervor that Merton admired in Dylan's poetry was something Merton himself had been seeking in his own writing, especially since the affair's discovery in June. At that time, he had declared his intention to write a new book now, in a, way, in a new way, in a new language, too. Bob Dylan had opened that door for him. During the last three weeks of September and much of October, Merton experienced his most joyful, intense period of listening to Dylan's songs and reading Dylan's poems, absorbing the offbeat, avant-garde prosody, and relishing the eccentric phrasings. It was an artistic honeymoon, and now these new horizons in poetry were emerging to re-energize Merton's own. During those same weeks, Merton composed most of a new collection of experimental verse, tentatively called Edifying Cables. The book contains 88 poems, or more precisely, it is one long poem in 88 numbered sections, with a prologue and an epilogue. In a sense, the book began with Dylan in mind, for Merton had already written to Ed Rice that the prospects of Nostradamus, 
first section of Cables to be written, would be ideal for Dylan to set to music. Dylan-like images and poetic devices seep into nearly every corner of the new project, giving it a startling freshness and an unmistakable oral quality. The book's eventual title, Cables to the Ace, or Familiar Liturgies of Misunderstanding, published by New Directions two years later, has a Dylan-like mock earnestness to it, and most tellingly, in the margin of one page of his working notebook for Cables, the Merton Scrawl, Bob Dylan is one of the most important voices in the country, infinite variety. An infinite variety a la Dylan seems to have been Merton's intention for Cables, for each section plays with tone and voice and illusion in its own kaleidoscopic way, throwing out seemingly random shards of language and flashing wordplay. There are satirical bits of advertising lingo, an absurdist business memo, a mock news report, quotes from classic writers, oblique literary allusions, an entire section in French, spoofs of nursery rhymes and devotional verse, mock theology, the hilarious pastiche of Nostradamus's prophecies, nonsensical lists, and more. Like Dylan's songs, Cables is full of free associative comic surrealism and high camp cheekiness, elements not often found in Merton's earlier poems. There are passages of Dada's dissociation in which Merton seems to imitate Dylan's liner notes to bringing in Highway 61. In Section 70 of Cables, for instance, he summarizes the plot of a TV show this way. Riot Woman, transformed into savings bonds, is traced to unforgettable swans for the entire ruin of one season. And there's Section 54, where Merton writes, Amid the cries of gang walls and surprises, the echoes come forward. They are nude. A brazen charm expands. It invests the unguarded senses. Twin stars rise over the library. Just as Dylan always included love songs on his albums, Merton includes lyrics about Margie and Cables. In section 75, he tenderly writes, I seek you in the hospital where you work. Will you be a patch of white moving rapidly across the end of the next hall? And in section 58, which is more skewed and complex, he refers to the Abbey's censoring of her mail. All the mailmen study my friendless state, holding back the letters. In that same piece, he humorously refers to the hermitage as his house of grammar and of wine. Cables also contains a couple of straightforward religious pieces. Few of Merton's devotional poems are as exquisite as section 80, which begins, slowly, slowly, comes Christ through the garden, speaking to the sacred trees. And one of the more mystical passages in all of his writings is section 84, headed with the German word Galassenite, serenity. In this prose poem, Martin again connects his own longing for the desert with the via negativa, the seeking of God in emptiness and primordial formlessness, with capitalized words signaling the presence of the divine. Desert and void, the uncreated is waste and emptiness to the creature not even sand, not even stone. But the uncreated is no, is no something, waste, emptiness, total poverty of the creator. Yet from this poverty springs everything. Infinite zero, everything comes from this desert nothing. Everything wants to return to it and cannot. For who can return nowhere? Passages as beautiful as anything in St. John of the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul. And two sections later, in 86, Merton picks up that theme again by quoting Meister Eckhart. The true word of eternity is spoken only in the spirit of the man who is himself a wilderness. Let's end it there. Thanks for listening.